This movie is a Patreon request from Lucas, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood by Quentin Tarantino. I have some conflicting views on this movie and on this episode movie breakdown, I'm just gonna let it all out and let you guys know how I feel about Quentin Tarantino's ninth film. What's up world, welcome to the episode movie breakdowns. I'm your host, Ali Zaka. And before I get started, is there a movie or TV show you want me to review? Let me know. Please put in the comments section below and I get to it as best I can. Also, at Patreon, Patreon slash Ali Zaka 2001. You get your review put out way before it comes on Facebook and YouTube. You also, get put it beginning the line because you're paying for me. I get to it immediately because you're paying for me and get it out there for you. And also get other content up there. Like right now, I'm about to put a content up for the our review on the new Marvel MCU release series. Like all the movies from like 2023 going forward so you can set other content out there but today's episode is not about that today's episode is about the patreon request for 2019's once upon a time in hollywood by quentin tarantino now what is this movie about this movie is about a faded television actor who was one of the greatest in his time on television and Eight years later, he's trying to still keep his relevancy, still trying to find his way as the main character and be a pretty much phenomenon and a major TV star in the 1960s, the golden age of the Hollywood. That's what he's trying to do. And he has a stunt devil who's his best friend, who's also there along with the journey of this character. That's pretty much the plot of this movie and the main plot. The things that I liked... I actually liked some of the main storylines. I did like Rick's storyline, Leonardo DiCaprio's character storyline, where he is trying to stay relevant in the world of Hollywood, but he's doing these jobs where he is the bad guy, being the heavy in the TV shows for other characters. And he's, he's watching his journey pretty much decline, and he's trying to find a way to save it. And he's very, like, like passionate about it. There's a scene where... He's talking to a little girl and he's reading a book about this guy who's also going through the same thing. And the little girl who's like, she's eight years old, but she's like, I'm method acting, I'm not breaking character for nothing. She's like, saw him crying and goes over and talks to him. And it's like, hey, you know, everything's gonna be okay. And, and this movie's funny because there's a joke where he throws at her and she goes, what? <laughs> it's just nothing. Like, he throws the joke at her super quick and her reaction from like, from being like a patch of what what you just say <laughs> it was it was definitely a very funny moment and the acting in this movie the storyline with Rick was really good and the fact that like he's declining and trying to find a way to save his career and become relevant again was really good but also the acting in this movie is great. Now granted you have Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt. You think this acting should be top tier. But not just from them. The rest of the cast is amazing. That little girl was phenomenal. That scene was probably one of my favorite scenes of this movie. Was just a great scene by, by that character and then Leonardo. And they bounced off each other. Mar James Martin shows up in this movie. I was like, James Martin! Yeah! <laughs> I'm not sure why I, I, I literally popped for James Martin, but he's in this movie and I was like, okay, let's go. Margaret Robbie, who I also popped for. Margaret Robbie, I love watching Margaret Robbie in movies. I think she's a great actress. She's in this movie and I was like, let's go. And like other characters, Kurt Russell, I believe, showed up in this movie and I was like, excuse me, Kurt Russell, <laughs> why are you here? Like, once again, let's go. The actors in this movie is amazing it's great acting the directing Quentin Tarantino delivers again directing and different camera angles different cut scenes where like he's making like acknowledges and and to old movies and he's also doing things where like if because movies it's pretty much about actors trying to continue their journey so a lot of stuff in this movie is not in scene or in set so like there are certain things that Jan or Quentin Tarantino would do where it's like he just he cut the movie and James Martin didn't have his head on. Now James Martin has his head on again. Wait a minute, what? Or he would do things in this movie where a character is giving exposition, but it is given in a way where they're not telling the audience directly. They're talking to somebody else, but it's off on the side. Like in the 
that exposition comes to fruition towards the end of the movie where one guy was saying like, yeah, so she was married, was engaged to him, but then went to film a film for this director here, you know, getting married to that director, but he's still around the circle because he knows when that dude messes up, he's going to slide back in and get her again. And something super simple, something like a, maybe a three minute, five minute talking point comes back into fruition at the end of the movie, which you're like, that's not the guy. And it's not like a quick, it's not even a, a quick, you know, oh my gosh, it happened. No, it was like, the dude was there, and then all of a sudden he's gone, and then the guy who she was dating before pop up, and they're together again in the same house. And if you didn't pay attention, you would know that Jay and Tom switched. They're not the same person towards the end of the movie. Something that I noticed based on the conversation that happened early in the movie. Also, another thing that happens is, like, foreshadowing or other comments were the other DiCaprio believed that if he got the chance to speak to this his next door neighbor, he will find his way back into a movie and, and be big again. And that doesn't that that happens like I would say twenty minutes, thirty minutes into the movie. You don't see that come to fulfillment towards the end of the movie again. And that's when that appeared. Also, a few things were like. Brad Pitt is with his dog and he's doing things with his dog to show that the dog is very well trained. So at the end of the movie, when you're wondering how can the dog not doing anything, the dog is legit just waiting for the signal. The dog is aware of what's going on, but he's she's waiting for the signal because Brad Pitt has already did these things in the beginning of the movie that shows you that this dog's a well trained dog. Also flamethrower scene that's talked about at the beginning of the movie, it also reappears. So like there's a lot of things in, in this movie that's not even like big focal points. So now I think we're like, yes, this is it. This is the golden the golden L. We gotta pick it up and take it to Neverland. No, no, no. This is like, oh yeah, I was doing this movie here where, you know, John Cena, we both had a ride a cow, like ride a um a bull a mechanical bull and then like towards the end of my movie the mechanical bull pops up out of nowhere you're like why do you still have that and when i saw the flamethrower again in this movie i was like why is that flamethrower there why does he have it he's like yeah i just had a flamethrower in my shed just, you know had it from the movie from like 10 years ago what you just gave you a flamethrower sure but I love how Quentin Tarantino did those little things where he set up exposition pieces to have it take effect later in the movie. And there's actually scenes where you're watching a TV show and the characters watching TV shows and, the, and people were talking in the background that I was listening to because I was curious to see what that stuff take effect later in the movie. And there's probably a lot of things I missed because of that, but this movie does a great job of setting stuff up without you even knowing it's being set up. But when it happened, you're not just blown away from it because it was talked about early in the movie. He was paying attention. And I do like that. I do like the little thing Quentin Tarantino, Quentin Tarantino did in this movie that I thought was kind of neat. And that the characters themselves set up stuff where you're like, okay, cool. I also like the character, like the fact that Brad Pitt character has a, a moral code in a sense. Yes, he killed his wife in this movie, but when they do the flashback on why it happened, she was trying to fight him on a boat and... Apparently, the relationship was on the rocks. They don't know, we never show exactly what happens. They just know that Brad Pitt returns, his wife's dead. And they said that he killed his wife, but he got off in court. Like, he didn't get convicted for murder, but everybody believes that he killed his wife. Well, in the movie, there's a girl who is young, so we're thinking, like, at least 18, 20. She actually played in Death Note, the live action movie. She was hitting on Brad Pitt, and Brad Pitt was like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not about to throw my life away for an 18-year-old or below 18-year-old who doesn't have ID to show me that she's 18 or older. He's like, what's your ID? And she wouldn't give it to him. He's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. You, you, I'm driving you home and that's it. And I actually like how like he had a, a moral code where he wasn't going to take advantage of a kid, 16 or 18 or wherever how old she is who is trying to hook up with a freaking adult. And I love the fact that he was like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. You're on your own, Jack. <laughs> Leave me out of this. And I appreciate that. I was like, right on. Because most movies when you watch, freaking man would be like, oh, nobody has touched me like this forever. I got to, she gave me a hug. <sighs> like, come on, man. Like, I like how Tarantino was like, he gave his characters some common sense. It was like, nah, that's not happening. 
And to add to that with that common sense, I like how his character has an like retrospective of like why he can't get a job with with Leonardo DiCaprio's character. He is sitting there thinking like, man, why don't we give me a job? And then he has a flashback, like a nine minute flashback that involves Kurt Russell and a Bruce Lee um, mimic artist, a mimic fighter, mimic stuntman, and they fight each other and he like breaks the wife's the director of the wife's car and he's like, yeah, yeah, fair enough. Like, I like how this movie does a little things like that where it sets you up and this character that Brad Pitt played has very common knowledge and very like aware of himself and aware of what's going on. Like, I like that. He's not a dumb character and just, just a cool dude. I like this. I like, I like the, the good points of this movie. This movie has some really good points that I really loved. One other thing I'm going to talk about before I get into, like, the negative things is the 1960s and 70s, before, like, you know, social media and before, before dating apps and before, you know, what is dating apps, social media, internet, people drove around and just picked up people. Like, people was cool pick, getting picked up like a hitchhiker. Before Uber and before, like, you know, yeah, before Uber and Lyft, people would just, like... On the street, hick hike, that's my thing, kissing my thumb. And there's multiple times where the girl who is, what's her name? Margaret Crawley. Margaret Crawley, I'm not gonna say her name. I might be demonetized her name on here, but Margaret Crawley, she is um, pretty much like, anytime Brad Pitt drove by, she would look over and be like, Hey, wanna give me a ride? Hey, wanna give me a ride? Like she was like trying to get him get him to pick her up and he was like, now nah, I'm going this way, and I go to go out the opposite way to pick up a girl. I love that. But also at the same time, it's kind of crazy thing, and I guess it's crazy today, but back then it makes sense that people just got picked up by people. People like they need a ride, need a ride, so they just hitchhike and somebody pick them up and the trust of this person not gonna do anything wrong, they'll take me to where I need to go. And Margaret Robbie does the same thing for another character in this movie too, just picks her up, drop her off, and like hope you good luck with everything. Like that to me today seems like a wild concept, but back then it actually made sense because you need to get somewhere, but you didn't have money to get a cab. You just ask for something to pick a hike, like, and you trust them to take you to where you need to go and be on the safe side. Like, that's it's kind of interesting. It's an interesting concept. But also, I heard about that though, like, people we used to drive around and like find a group of people hang out driving around, like, hey, where you want to go? Want to go to this party? Let's go to this party. Like, that's how people connected back then. Now, you you will rarely see that because everybody got Uber, Live, and dating apps and social media. So you need a ride. You can get you get it from somebody. You don't have to, you know, sell the side of the road and get hitchhiked. And hopefully, the person that's picking you up is a safe person taking you somewhere safe. That's it's a little an interesting concept that I liked in the world that Quentin Tarantino made for this movie was based off reality. And I like the fact he made that little touch in reality back in this movie. Now the dislikes. I did not like the two hours and 41 minute movie. Like this movie is two hours and 41 minutes for no reason. It just seemed like it was long for no reason. And the payoff at the end, granted it was entertaining to watch. It just seemed like completely out left field. And I understand that Sharon Tate was actually murdered by the Manson family in real life. And this is like Quentin Tarantino rewriting history so that way she actually doesn't get murdered. She is saved by our main characters who thought that was her place. And, well, not even her place. They were just going to kill a bunch of celebrities in this area. And they end up going to the house in real life. But the house in the movie was the same house that was in real life. And pretty much they find Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt characters there. And they pretty much take care of the, the three murderers. I... The ending, when it comes down to it, like you can, you know that Brad Pitt can hold his own. He's a stunt devil, and just throughout the movie, he has done things where he showed that he has very good um, martial arts ability. He can jump up, like he can do stunt. He does stunts. So, like if we're jumping up to a roof from the bottom floor of the house, doesn't bother him. Where he can jump up to one part of a wall, jump to another wall, and up like a ninja warrior. It didn't bother him. And also when he fought Bruce Lee mimic character you know he's capable of handling a kick and also 
protecting himself. So the ending, it makes sense, but it was just so left field to me because I was like, wow, this, this got Quentin Tarantino like real quick out of any other movie. Like this right here was pretty much basic as far as blood goes and then just blood galore towards the end. But the two hour 41 minute length didn't, didn't need to be necessary. Also, there's a lot of feet images in this movie. Like you see the bottom of women's feet for some reason. And I feel like Quentin Tarantino has a foot fetish because you see Margaret Robbie's foot, you see Margaret Qualley's foot, and first you see somebody else's foot as well, and you're just like, what's, what's with the feet? Why? Why do I need to see the feet? And why the foot dirty? Like, <laughs> I don't know, it, was just, it, was, it threw me off. Like, like, Margaret Robbie wasn't wearing shoes, but she was. But, <laughs> and then Margaret Robbie's scenes in this movie, like her, her scenes in the movie didn't seem to be necessary. I feel like that was really unnecessary for for her in this movie. She's a great actress, but I feel like she didn't need to be in this movie. Like, if you cut out her scenes in this movie, the movie would be just fine and flow just as well. You can show her being a next door neighbor. You can show her, you know, she didn't even interact with, with Leo and Brad Pitt at all. Matter of fact, she knows of him and she knows that he lives next door and she's a fan, but she never really interacted with him. So therefore her being in this movie was almost unnecessary. I thought that at one point Brad Pitt or Leo was going to make, you know, make a move on her and be in a relationship with her throughout this movie. That doesn't happen at all. It's almost like two different movies and they just cut away from Leo and Brad Pitt to give us a 20 minute segment of Margaret Robbie. And then Brad Pitt's gone for 20 minutes of the movie. And you're like, I want to know what Brad Pitt's been up to. I don't know what Brad Pitt, like, how he handles Margaret Qualley's character and how he gets away from her or, or she follows him and then becomes obsessed with him. Like, I want to know how that storyline is going to play out. I want to know if Leonardo DiCaprio goes down to a deep, some, like, a deep hole of his emotions and can't get out of it and pretty much and become his downfall. Reality, it doesn't. Matter of fact, Leonardo DiCaprio's character turns around and goes to Italy and becomes a, a big, bigger movie star in Italy than he was in the United States. And... Living life good, like he's having a good time, and Brad Pitt and Leo character are just best friends who hang out with each other, and that's it. Like that's pretty much it. So the two hour and forty minute running time was just unnecessary for me, and the Margaret Robbie character stuff just seemed unnecessary as well. And that what bothers me in this movie: acting is great, the directing is great. The cast is amazing. It's just that parts of the movie, one's too long and the other parts of it just seem, just seem unnecessary. And when I was watching it, I almost fell asleep. I was like, man, I should stop and come back to the movie tomorrow. But I was like, no, this movie's 2 hours and 41 minutes. I have to finish it. And I was watching it. I feel like there's, there's no plot, really. Like, because... Leo's character's issue gets resolved within two hours of the movie. Brad Pitt character doesn't really, like, he resolves that quickly, so that's not really an issue. Like, so he doesn't get caught up, so it's like, okay, cool. So you have to deal with good people. They go out and get drinks. They get a cab back home. They don't drink. They don't drunk drive. They actually get a cab to go back home. Like, these people are good people. Like, what? what's wrong? What's wrong? Nothing really. It's, that was it. So, like, the length of this movie really hurt me. In the Margaret Robbie parts, I feel like you could have took out and it would have been a it would have been the movie would have got its point across without having Margaret Robbie in the movie. Not not gonna just saying her character and her story. As far as, you know, the actress herself and when she was on the screen, what she did was great. It just I felt like she was unnecessarily there. And it's that's all it felt like. Sadly. Sadly. Okay. Let's go ahead and get into the cast directing. And box office. So the movie came out in 2019. Once Upon a, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out in 2019. Directed by Quentin Tarantino. Written by Quentin Tarantino. The box office here. The movie had a budget of $90 million. It grossed worldwide $374 million. The cast... Leonardo DiCaprio, who played Rick Dalton, amazing, great job. Brad Pitt, who played Cliff Booth, once again, amazing, great job from him. Margaret Robbie, who played Sharon Tate, great job from her, really good. Margaret Qualley, who played, I'm just going to say her name, I'll get demonetized, but Pussycat, she did great. Like, I enjoyed 
her character thought she thought she did a good job. Mike Moe, who played Bruce Lee. Oh, that actually was Bruce Lee. Oh shoot. No. That could be Bruce Lee. He said, yeah, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee made this guy famous. But that was actually Bruce Lee. I guess a Bruce Lee stunt double. I don't know. But he actually played Bruce Lee. But I feel like he wasn't Bruce Lee. That's interesting. But I thought he did a good job too. I was like believing his character. And the last two people I want to give a shout out to is Julia Butchers, who played Trudy Fraser, who was amazing. She was great in her role and her cast. And she was probably one of the bright spots with her sitting on the sitting on the um, set with Leo and they just going back and forth with each other. I thought that was great. And then Timothy O. O. Platt, who played James Stacy, thought he did a good job. And it's funny. I mixed up Timothy with James Marsden at one point, but Marsden's in this movie, and <laughs> I thought they was the two. I was like, wait, is that James Marsden? He, it was it was when I saw him, but when I saw Timothy, I was mixing them up. Just thought that was kind of funny. All right, any other thoughts? I don't really have any other thoughts with this movie. Like, I already talked about the, the, ooh, I do actually, music. So you know I'm a big deal when it comes to music. Music in this movie is not, it's not that much there. It's there in between. It only is played when the characters are either listening to the radio or listening to the car radio or listening to, um, not the record player. That's the only time when they had music playing. Any other time when the car is turned off and they're walking, there's no music. When they're out doing, doing things about, there's no music. The only time there's music playing in this movie is when you're driving with a character or you listen to a record player they're listening to. Other than that, there's no music in this movie. I thought that was kind of neat. I thought I just liked that little touch on that movie because it made it seem more realistic because when you walk around, unless you have headphones in, there's, there's no music. You're just walking in the universe or the earth or whatever your nature, your surroundings. You're just walking in it. So I thought that was kind of neat. I already talked about the directing. That was great. The cast, great. Lighting, setup was great. Story was the hit and miss part for me. All right, this is a Friday night movie. This movie's two hours and 41 minutes long. I don't think it's a Friday night movie which you watch your friends and family. I don't think everybody's gonna be involved in it. So I'm gonna say no on that. And grading time. I'm gonna grade Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm gonna give this movie a B minus. It gives a B minus for me. It's an 80%. I was stuck on the on the cusp of giving it a C plus, the same nine percent to B minus, and the reason why the story wasn't the strongest. The story was not necessary. The strongest thing in this movie is certain parts. The and not necessarily the strongest thing is a weird way to say it, but it wasn't necessary in certain parts of certain characters, and it wasn't just the strongest story there is. The movie issues are resolved within the first two hours of this movie, but then you get another forty minutes of this movie after you resolved everything, and the movie kind of ends without really knowing what happens to. What happens to you know, Cliff? What happened to Brad Pitt's character? Like, does Rick go see him in the morning? Is he gonna be okay? Granted, Brad Pitt's character said I might have a limp, so he probably told you that like he's not gonna be able to walk as well, so that ends his stunt doubling career. But Brad Pitt and Leo is gonna go several ways at the end of the movie anyway. But there's no hard feelings of just like hanging out buzz for like ten plus years. So it. This movie, as far as storyline goes, is not the strongest story, but the acting, directing, the little things in this movie, in fact, the movie was funny, really does give this movie some more oomph in this movie. And the cast that comes in, they deliver to go 110%. So there's more oomph in this. Like, I can give it a 79.5, which I don't do points. It'd probably be a 79.5. Like, but I'm going to go with the 80%. Just give it a B minus. This movie is a B minus for me. Let's see what IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes give this movie. IMDb gives this movie a 7.6 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes, the critics give this movie a 85%. That is a B. And the audience gives the movie a 70%. That is a C minus. This movie gets a C minus from the audience. The critics give the movie an 85%, which is a B. And the 7.6 out of out of 10, that is a C, solid C from IMDb. I'm gonna give this movie a 80% at B minus. So I fall in between the audience and the critics of Rotten Tomatoes. I just feel like this movie wasn't the strongest. The two hour length was unnecessary, but it has a very good spots in it, very good parts in the movie, and the acting just goes all in. So if you've seen the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood from 2019, what did you think? Please put in the conversation below on that. 
See you guys next episode of Movie Breakdowns. Keep being awesome. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this video. I really appreciate that. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. If there's a review you want me to watch or do, let me know. Please put it in the comment section below this video. Also, you want to watch the last episode of Movie Breakdowns. It's right there. Just got to click on it and you'll be able to watch it. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Love y'all. And keep being awesome.